We are live. Welcome to our first ever YouTube live show here on the Arn Show on the Four Horsemen ne Network. This is Paul Bromwell, and today I'm joined by the founder of the Four Horsemen, the creator of the Spine Buster. That's right. He's 1A of tag team wrestling. He's our television champion, Mr. Arn Anderson. Arn, how are you? And welcome to the Four Horsemen Network live with our audience here watching us. This is awesome. I am in a great mood because today is a first. And you know how I feel about first. You only get oh, yeah. one, one crack at a first. And uh, things are changing. And uh, I just, uh, last couple of weeks, Brock and I have had a blast. Really have. Let's get into it, man. While we're waiting, people are starting to filter in the chat. It's so good to see so many of you here with us that are watching live. And I want to talk about it because you've been in Indianapolis at the Squared uh, Circle Expo. Then you mm -hmm. were at WrestleCon just this past weekend. Can you share with our audience kind of your time the last couple of weekends, what it's been like seeing the fans? I, I heard you got hooked up with some Hershey bars. Just what has it been like for you? Well, it's just a, it's a whole group of fans from that area of the, of the country. I've never done that squared circle uh, show before, but I've been hearing about it for a couple of years. I, you know, Arn, you need to do that show, man. The guy really does a good job with it. And, buddy, they were not kidding. There were people from all over the place. The crowd was huge, was organized well, and Brock and I got to meet a ton of folks that we had never met before. And some that we had that made the trip. So it was uh it was a great weekend, it really was. Man, I'm so glad to hear that. What a what a great weekend all around for, for wrestling and uh so much going on. Not only did I see some great pictures of you and Brock together at WrestleCon that were all over social media, but one of the things that you always talk to me about is Paul, it's so cool to just to see guys that I have worked with over the years at these things. And uh, who were some of the guys that you got to catch up with a little bit that it was just, you know, fun for you to see again and rub elbows with. Oh, well, I mean, uh, Shanghai Pierce, I okay. know the name, you know, he's really a sweetheart of a guy. Shelton Benjamin. I hadn't seen him in forever. He was at WrestleCon, uh, God Almighty, how can I draw a blank on this? I saw so many people. Um, of course, the usual, Ted DiBiase was there with his wife, and his wife and my wife are very good friends. Nice. Dean Malenko, okay. obviously, and his wife and my wife are very good friends. Uh, Simmons, you know. The, yeah, Ron Simmons, I was going to ask if you got to see him. Teddy Long. Uh, play a player. <laughs> yeah, I bust out laughing just seeing him. Uh, it, uh, you know, Jake the Snake was there. Obviously, he was next to us. He had a hell of a line. The Hardys had him out the door. It was, it was Tony's usual guys, and then a bunch of guys I hadn't seen in a while. It's, it's. Uh, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank right now. But there were so many people that I saw. It seems like a blur. You know what I mean? Nah, man. No, it's all good. Listen, lots happening that weekend because you told me, you said, Paul, the line was long and you got to meet so many people at WrestleCon. It was one of your best weekends that you and Brock ever had. So, hey, man, that's what it's all about, that. And uh, you, at, one of the guys, uh, Holy, I think his name is Holy Dizzle. Holly Dizzle, Holy Dizzle. You know who, the, who I'm talking about. He said, Paul, I got him three extra big. Hershey's with almonds. What did you say to him when he gave you those candy bars? The king size, what I'm talking about, not not, not the the middle big one, the big one, three of those. I went, brother, I, I love you, but if you it, next time you see me, I'm going to be 300 pounds if I eat these things. But thank you. Thanks for yeah. thinking of me. And, Wilfred uh, Brimley, diabetes is going to set in ooh. if you start chucking down this chocolate like these guys are throwing at you, man. God bless them, you know, but it, the, the thought is that they listen to the show, yeah, you know, they're so supportive and, yep. you know, little things like that was almost an inside deal. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I do. And you were telling me that a lot of listeners were saying how they love the podcast and my God, there are so many people here in the chat. I am 
listen, you are overwhelming me right now. You guys, all of you from Charlie. Yes. Uh, from, from social media, Twitter. I see you, Charlie. We love you, man. To hoop, to Brian Haremza, to Herman. I can't even say all the names. Everybody is here loading up. They're saying, this is awesome. We've been looking forward to this and everybody is here and, and it continues to grow on the count for this first Arn live show and uh Arm, I'm, I'm pumped about about us doing this and watching the comments flying guys if you want to ask questions i promise you we're going to jump into december 1994 and all the good stuff that uh goes with it here in a minute use the super chat function that'll help take your question all the way to the top for us and uh and we would really appreciate that and make sure we don't miss miss uh the questions yes the research guy we know you're here too but before we get in december 94 on i wanted to talk about this weekend because a few special people in your life had some big moments this weekend and we'll, we'll start with the hall of fame uh, a few folks i want to talk about number one paul Heyman. uh he goes into the hall of fame don't know if you got to catch up with the speech but from the years of dangerous alliance working with him in wcw all the way through working behind the scenes with him, what you did there in, in your WWE time, to see someone like him recognized for his creative genius. How cool was it see, to hear about him going to the Hall of Fame? Well, he certainly earned it. I mean, his body of work throughout the industry, and I think that should play a part of some of the entrance into the Hall of Fame, just their body of work. You know, it's not that they were used on top and they were in so many main events or X number of big matches or all that, but what was their body of work to contributing to the business? And a guy like Paul Hammond, how can you deny him? You know, he's been in there and uh, for what, 25 years? Yeah, off and on. I mean, yeah, he had a little time. But listen, and he did, his speech was his way and I loved every freaking second of it. Uh, so good. He threw the leather coat on the headset. He had the, the phone. He brought, brought out the phone that he used to crack so many skulls. It was so good, dude. It was, it was, it was well done. Yeah. It was awesome. You know, Barry and Mike. So, yeah, happy, about so, them. so happy for those guys. Any accolade you can give Barry Wyndham is probably not, not enough. You know, he, uh, we say it all the time. That guy was so good. Mike Rotundo. Tremendous performer, probably underrated from just what he brings to the table. I mean, the guy can have a great match with anybody and, and a good, solid guy. And with uh, the, the, the year that he's had, you know, I'm glad that he had something, you know, to really just feature him, to get, get his mind on just his career because he did. If you knew Mike as a producer, if you knew him as a performer, you saw just how in tune he was. And uh, I'm very, very happy for both of those guys as well. There, there's a gentleman that I want to ask you about. Did you get to work with or talk to or get to know behind the scenes Thunderbolt Patterson at all uh, during your career? On I wrestled him a few times when I first, Ole and I first teamed up. That was like him and Manny Fernandez was our first opponents. Believe it or not. Now this okay. is back in 80, 85. That would be. So when I first went to Crockett and, uh, Ole and I got together and he took me on as a partner. That was our first team that we worked with Thunderbolt Patterson. I haven't seen him, you know, in years and years, you know, he's kind of been off the radar, but, uh, yes. So we, we had an awesome uh, Hall of Fame time. I want to talk about someone who you've spent a lot of time with, not only with their their daddy, but their older brother. And then you spent a lot of time with as coach. And that's Cody's big weekend. He finishes a story, walks out of night two. Uh, just a fantastic ending to, to that event, WrestleMania. Which, by the way, you and I were just talking before the show started. A million dollars in merch for that guy over the weekend of all events. But how, how happy are you uh, for Cody just on a, on a personal basis to see what he's been able to now accomplish, man? Well, uh, you know, he, um, he bet on himself. When he left the first time from WWE, nobody, including me, thought it was a great idea because they were offering him a lot of money to stay. But he had, you know, a game plan, and he knew what he had to do to execute it. And he made a decision to move on. And uh, 
what a what a career he had on his own, you know, until he made his way back, you know, to WWE. And, and I was one of the guys that I didn't want him to leave AEW. Uh, I certainly encouraged him to stay because he was kind of in control of his own destiny. Uh, we had that conversation, but I also had this to come in right behind it. If whatever decision you make is for the good of your family, then it can't be wrong. And when I talk about good, when you say good of your family, when you say a million dollars in in merch merch sold, that's good, good for your family. He's now, I think, extended his contract and he'll be there at least till he's over 40. And you were again saying before we joined, he's the type of guy that will have a future with them as long as he wants. Well, and if you're building a roster, if you started from ground zero tomorrow, I'm going to build a company, you know, who do you want that's marketable, that's tremendous performer, that's that's somebody that you can depend on, that's, that's going to draw your money, it's going to sell merch, and it's just going to be a valuable guy to have in the locker room all the way around. That would be to- Cody. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. Buddy, we got our first super chat coming in from Riddler3579. And he simply wanted to say, thank you, Arn and Paul, for this awesome channel. And uh, you're Riddler3579, you popped the super chat cherry for our channel never before. And and we certainly hope it won't be the end. But man, thank you so much. We we can't do this without the without the fr- uh, fans are. And you say it all the time at these different shows and things that you attend. S- so huge. So thank you so much. Yeah, I can't thank you enough. And hey, your name will go down in history. I hope you know that. That's right. Can't, hopefully, ten years from now, they'll be talking about this, and they'll go, "Who was the first first super chat guy?" And you're it, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Congrats. This is so exciting for Arn and I. You have no idea. Uh, you, you never know what's going to happen when you decide to make that I, that that decision to go out on your own, Arn. And that's what we're doing. We're betting on ourselves. And you, you hear a lot of that. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's I'm excited about it. So uh, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. We got another chat coming in here now. And it's from uh, our buddy Mike Coop. He said, Arn, I saw something I had forgotten or never seen, the DX Shockmaster bit. Whose idea was that, and how fun is it? So they, uh, you know that they did their own Shockmaster bit uh, as well. Do you remember them but putting when that together? They did a parody of the Shockmaster? They did Master? a parody of it. Do you recall that at all? Or? How did I miss that? What year was that? I, I don't know. Hoop, throw it in the chat. I'll, I'll look for it if you remember the year to help, uh, you know, rattle the cobwebs a little bit. But if you have any other detail, uh, put it in the chat. But, yeah, they did a parody of it, and uh, – he said he'd either forgotten or never seen it. I think some, a few of us has, have forgotten about it as well. But um, Arn, I guess he said you were involved as the voice. You remember you did the uh, Oli voice part. Oh yeah, it's yeah, coming now, back now. Something's coming back. Did you? You? you I think you I got. Old. I think the way it went was I got busted backstage like the, a camera pan back there and busted me and i took off or something trying to get out of the line of the of the camera shot is that is that what is that, is that right he's gonna um, hoop's gonna look for it for us so more to come we'll do some follow-up and maybe we'll I, he'll get the link to us on social and then i'll send it to you and you can check if it i out. can see a clip of it, i can probably yeah, remember yeah 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 we'll get it we'll get it and uh, man, all these comments flying in, and but we got to start our show, guys. We got to get going. And believe it or not, Arn and I are after this, after we're done here tonight, we're joining uh, a gentleman out of Boston for sports radio that wants to interview us and talk about the Four Horsemen Network and talk to Arn about his career. So uh, we got an interview set up after this, but let's jump in. We're about 14 minutes or so into the show and talk about December 1994, arguably, Arn, the worst uh, main event in Starcade history. 
But we before we get there and talk about Hulk versus the Butcher, let's talk about December 1994 and everything that happened before we get to Nashville. And during our November show, uh, we talked about the Macho Man Randy Savage. He leaves WWF. He joins WCW. And I thought we could talk a little bit here about Randy and your impression of him. Do you think that Savage, in your mind, Arn, was the total package in terms of look, presentation, <laughs> charisma, promo, wrestling, all that? I don't know what the weaknesses would be if there were any. I, you, you got any? I don't see any. I mean, the guy was in shape. He took care of his body. He was businessman. I mean, if, if you're talking character, he had the full full character on, you know, though there was no doubting who the macho man was. That's for sure. Well, not only that, you also hear the stories about how everything to him was so detailed out and scripted. You go back to the matches he had with Steamboat, the match he had with him at WrestleMania three written out on, on paper and practiced at house shows and live events. He, the wait, devil wait. was in the details and he was all over it. And the fact that he was able to put something start to finish along with Steamboat, you know, you had to have the other guy be able to pull that off too. To be able to put that together and pull it off the way you already had it organized without really playing to the fans and their reaction. I mean, they must have stuck to the script, I would think. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. So we talked about it last week. He makes his first televised appearance uh, for well, two weeks ago prior, a few weeks ago. Now we're not doing these weekly, but we talked about the last time we were together talking November uh, about December 3rd, 1994. He's interviewed by me and Gene Okerlund. And during that segment, Savage uh, said the only reason he was here in WCW was to confront Hulk Hogan. And uh, declaring the past, present, and future the best wrestler in the universe was Macho Man Randy Savage. And Hulk would always be number two. Savage calls Hulk right out then and there. And Gene says, not here tonight, buddy. But he will be at Starcade. Savage said that he can, can't wait to confront Hulk. But by hook or by crook, he was going to be at Starcade. But he left the audience with the following line to close the interview. This is what he says, Arnie. He says, one of two things are going to happen. Savage was going to extend his hand and shake it, or he's going to slap him in the face. So let's talk a little bit about this segment here, Arn. Savage never appeared ever for Jim Crockett, WCW at all to this point. But thanks to national television and Slim Jim, he's undeniably a household name. Thanks to, again, national TV he gets great reaction from the crowd. They all know who he is. And despite this being a televised uh, you know, taping at the Orlando Studios, we now know as wrestling fans that thanks to the internet reestablishing a star, you know, to a, to a new wrestling audience is almost a secondary thought. But here, though, Arn, in 1994, there's no internet. And we're often treated to vignettes to introduce wrestlers. Do you think the one foreman interview did Savage justice because of his visibility and notoriety, you know, whether it be Slim Jim, WWF? I mean, he's a guy that everybody pretty much just knew who he was, right? I don't think there's a soul on earth that saw Randy on TV and went, who is that? Right. I mean, it was just too high profile. He had too many years uh, under that WWF umbrella, WWE. Uh, he just, you know who Randy Savage was. And hey, if you think the Slim Jim commercial doesn't, didn't take his profile up another notch, you know, we kind of laugh at it, but of course it did. I mean, oh, yeah. it was, those commercials were everywhere. It, it's just, if you're on TV and your face, that's the thing about wrestling. It's, you don't have a football helmet on. You don't have a baseball hat on. You don't have hockey helmet on. It's your face. And that's what they see. And you zoom in on that face. And that's why professional wrestlers that have been on TV for a while are so visible. And so memorable is your zero in on their mug. And let's be honest here. This is probably about five years after the height of his popularity, but you still got to feel like he's a needle mo mover at this point, right? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, so it was five years later. So what? I mean, people remember, people still remember. <laughs> I go to these, these signings and stuff, Paul, it was like, they saw you yesterday. You know, they remember. And, uh, 
you know, they can tell you stories. They can tell you matches. They can thank you for my childhood. And when I was eight years old, I hated your guts because I like this guy over here. I mean, wrestling fans, when they tune in, they remember it's part of their childhood slash life. And uh, it's not like they went to Randy Savage. Well, I didn't, you know, didn't think he, I thought he was too old. Yeah. He walked in in shape, ready to go. And what's something now is age is almost not even a, a thing anymore nowadays. It's like the guys that are in their forties, late forties or whatever, some of the biggest stars in the, of the company at this yep. point. Absolutely. You know? If you can still bring it, age yeah. is a number. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, let's move away from Macho Man at this point because uh, WCW is going to travel overseas and this time on you're, you're headed with them. They're going back to Germany at this point. And uh, this is uh, just a, a quick tour prior to the pay-per-view event that we're going to get to that happens in Nashville. And uh, Steve Austin and Vader, though, they're not on this tour. They have injury issues and they're given some time off to help recuperate a little bit prior to Starcade. Uh, but Hulk Hogan and the Three Faces of Fear, they stayed stateside and didn't travel for this one either. But let's talk about the two nights of the tour. It's you and Bunkhouse Buck working the semi-main event against the Nasty Boys. And uh, both cards are headlined by uh, Sting versus Paul Roma. And uh, these two shows, respectively, in Germany, 1,000 fans one night, 900 fans uh, another night. And I'll kind of go through the card here for you. So you got Alex Wright defeating Bobby Eaton. You got Marcus Alexander Bagwell and the Patriot defeating Harlem Heat. Guys, listen to this card. Talk about some wrestlers. You have WCW champion Johnny B. Bad defeating Jean Paul Levesque. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Nasty Boys defeating Arn Anderson and Bunkhouse Buck. And then Sting defeating Paul Roma. Buddy, it's been three decades. But Hulk, Vader, Austin, and the Faces of Fear are off the card. But man, we've discussed it time again, the time and time again. The foreign tours did great business, even in the most downtime for pro wrestling. And I don't expect you to remember the why, but can you speculate though? Well, not as I said, 900 and a thousand fans, it, it's pretty low for, for these shows. Well, what I do remember, and we had a laugh about this, I did see the nasty boys uh, at these last two events, Squared Circle and Andy, and so on. The, uh, this weekend passed in uh, WrestleCon and the first night we're, we're wrestling the nasty boys and they're in the ring and bunkhouse buck and I come to the ring. This is one of those, one of those stories. that's just ridiculous. I pop up on the apron and I look at the crowd and I'm giving a guy some shit. And when I turned around right there is knobs who clipped me, with a forum, the match ain't even started. We ain't even got in the ring. Boom, right across the bridge of the nose, splattered my nose, broke my nose right off the get go. So I pop off the apron, and all I can hear if you've ever been broke your nose, your eyes start watering, your ears start ringing, can't see, can't really hear. And all I hear is Sax going, Jesus Christ, you fat bastard, what are you doing? The match ain't even started. <laughs> He's cussing out knobs. <laughs> it's one of those deals where you just go, what are you going to do? So I blew the blood out of my nose ringside, as disgusting as that may be. And we started the match and had the match. But that was the first thing physically that happened. That's what I remember. Well, and at least, you know, with the broken nose full of blood, you weren't smelling anybody's pits that night during that whole gimmick move. So. I, I think if my mood would have been what I think it would have been, we never got to the pit spot. The pit spot didn't happen for you. I'm taking that out, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> my, my ass might have been a touch chat. I'm just guessing. <laughs> but we had a laugh about that uh, uh, the last two weekends on the road. I think it's pretty cool here, too, that you team up with Jimmy Golden and Colonel Robert Parker, not only domestically, but internationally. And we know how much you admire both these guys, but I think that that's, that's kind of fun, that you're overseas with them, you're here in the States with them. Oh, yeah. And hey, I'm telling you, Bunkhouse Buck was a player. Make no mistake. Colonel, same thing. You know, what, what a visible presence he was as a manager. I mean, he did all the right things. So, yeah, man, I was honored. I was honored to be tag teaming with those guys. I don't know 
it was two German cities, right? Yeah, it so was. It was. I think it was one of those that I don't know what the answer was. There was, I do faintly remember, well, the card wasn't red hot. It was just names against names. If you think yeah, about it, was it. probably like, let's draw them on a couple of stars sting. And, and you know what I mean? Hope to hope to get them out that way, especially without Hogan and you know, some of your key players that didn't make the trip. I've always been of the proponent that you can have names, but if you don't have angles and it's just matches, that's not as appealing as having angles off of television that they know the storyline. Arn, you just said so much there in that 30 second answer. You need stories. Storytelling is so important. I feel that way. Mm. You can ask wrestling fans how they feel, but I think, if you've got an ongoing angle from television, that is better, even if it's on a lower place on the card, than just having guys that are maybe upper middle guys against each other, but no story. Are you of the opinion, since we're here, let's talk about it. Does every match on the card or every, every, does every, yeah, every match on the card, does it need a story or is it okay to have some with stories and some are just going to be some, some nice matchups? can't have them all okay and you shouldn't try to have them all but you should certainly have your last three or four matches have a story I have a like. meaning yep and you can have the first four just be good good matchups from a chemistry standpoint it's just going to be a the crowd well done you know yeah. match who was alex right with bobby eaton yes yeah i can bet you can bet your ass that was a hell of a match oh yeah but with no build up, probably. And, you know, Alex was a, he would have been the home guy. I'll just give you an example. He was from Germany. He was, his dad wrestled in Germany. He was brought up in Germany. When you put him in maybe a, a feature match for a title. You would think so, right? Put uh, put all the shine on him while you're in Germany. Why not? Not that Bobby Eaton's not a great opponent. Yeah, but great I know performer, but yeah. you know, put something, uh, there was nothing probably at stake. If you were ever going to put a spotlight on Alex, Wright, That would have been the time to do it. <clears throat> of course it would. Yeah. And it no. would be, you know, you'd have to ask whoever was in charge at the time, why you didn't, but it, you know, he's a home a homeboy. He is. He is home turf. All right, Arn. So let's transition. You come back from Germany and it's time to talk about Starcade 1994. It's uh, uh, described as having the weakest main event in the history of the Starcade run. All right. right. So go ahead. Take a few steps. You're going to want to get ready for this. Because in 1994, they branded the event Starcade Triple Threat. It takes place in Nashville at the Municipal Auditorium. Uh, 8,200 fans in attendance for this one. Big crowd in Nashville that night. Nashville is often called Nash Vegas these days, Arn, and it's home to many wrestling events. And the Municipal Auditorium always drew a crowd, it felt like. Talk to us about that city. And do you have any memories of uh, the Municipal Auditorium as a venue? Well, it had been built, you know, by the Memphis Territory mm -hmm. over the years. It became a wrestling city. Um, and then as the country music industry exploded, that city has grown and grown and grown. And it accommodates. It's kind of like on a smaller scale, just like you have Chicago that, if you run a wrestling show, it doesn't really matter what company you're in. They support you. They come out and you have a good house. doesn't just have to be the big, two big companies or, you know, same thing kind of with Nashville. And uh, you got a lot of smaller companies and you have some wrestling schools scattered around. It's become a hotbed for building the business, I think. Oh, abs absolutely. Uh, someone just, I saw, saw popped in the chat mania potentially could be there in 2027. It is, uh, you know, you got the Titans building their big stadium there. Uh, it's, it's a lot going on in Nashville. One of the most fun places to go to, I think at least on the East coast, it's, uh, you know, where all the bachelorette parties and all the, uh, they're all happening down in Nashville. It's an entertainment, you know, Mecca for entertainment. And, uh, it was a lot of fun down there for Ric Flair's last match. 
uh, when we got to go down there and experience all that. So uh, it, it's happening. Well, down here at this point, it's happening. By, by the way, guys, if you have a question, throw them in. Uh, super chat for sure. We'll make sure we answer as we go through the card if you have anything specific for December 94. But let's jump in because uh, Dave Meltzer, everybody's favorite dirt sheet writer, has some uh, thoughts here to open the show. He said, uh, for Starcade on December 27th at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium, the stars of the company had to be those in charge of promoting the show locally. The show drew a real sellout, the first in years for a WCW major show, with 8,200 fans, about 7,000 paid, and a $90,000 house. The show sold out three hours early, a site so foreign to WCW that many of the office people were out front taking photos of the box office with the sold out signs before match time. I'd suspect it was either close to or the all time record house for Nashville, which has housed pro wrestling since the beginning of time. The period, and we're going to talk about this from December 25th to January 1st is traditionally one of the two easiest periods of the year to draw fans to wrestling Thanksgiving weekend being the other. And I suspect that will make the buy rate surprisingly decent when it comes to, uh, when it comes out as far as, uh, you know, early predictions and, and the buy rate and all that. Uh, but if this card had taken place at any other time, I doubt there would have been much, much interest at all. In other words, Arn, Dave argued that the holidays are historically some of the best times for pro wrestling and WCW was fortunate uh, you know, of this date that the event take place. Talk about that because we've talked about it here before, but why is it holidays back in this time and especially late 80s? Jim Crockett was always successful with Thanksgiving and the holidays. Why was it always such a big deal uh, back in those days for wrestling to run during the holidays? Kids are out of school. Thanksgiving or Christmas is part of their Christmas. Could have been tickets to the show. Christmas presents. They make great Christmas presents. And the fact that, uh, you know, in the old days when you were smart, that whole week you would book your best towns and give them like a reward for the kids are out of school. It's easy. We could take them down to the show. They're still, it's not like we got to, you know, get them up early to go to school the next day. They're off the whole week and you feature about six or seven of your prime towns and reward them by giving them a Christmas week show. And that's the way the business was. And it, you know, people, even if you get up in the morning and you open presents and all that, you could still like, and everybody lived in Charlotte, for an example, you could get up to Christmas with your kids and still make a one o'clock show. And then you could drive a hundred miles down the road to Greenville, South Carolina and get a second show because it was drivable was not a problem, not an issue that that's just a good week that people are in a good mood and they're spending money and they're having a blast. It's, uh, you know, who, t and you see who's taking advantage of, of the holiday season. Now it's all NFL, you know, whether it's, you're getting Christmas day games, NBA Christmas day games, uh, you know, sports is really leans into those holiday periods at this, at this point. It would be my pick. Wouldn't it yeah. be you? I don't mind NFL on Christmas Day at all. Yeah, yeah. I hey, I'm for it. Open those gifts up. Get the food. Well, let's get the food going, and, it, and it's time to turn on the the TV and watch some football. <laughs> Ain't nobody got to argue with you about that, Paulie. <laughs> well, let's talk about this card here. Here we are, and uh, there's a couple of things to note here. Vader defeats Hacksaw Jim Duggan. For the United States title, the finish saw Harley Race interfere in the match. Vader dropped Duggan following the distraction. So this is significant, Arm, because following Halloween Havoc, there had been an effort by WCW to heat Vader back up, and he was the number one contender for the world title. Uh, Vader was the type of monster, though, uh, that Hulk would, would have loved to conquer during the golden era. Do you think after nearly a year out of the world title picture, hey, it's time to, to heat this guy up and start to make him the monster that he once was uh, for Hulk Hogan. I don't think you had to do a whole hell of a lot. I mean, because he was still a big menacing monster. You know, he hadn't been damaged as a character, I don't think. I think you could heat him up at any time and, and have what you were looking for, a competitor and a challenger for Hogan any day of the week. 
Yeah, for sure. And and just again, watching Vader, seeing some what some of the big guys now and some of the moves that they can do in the ring, I, my mind often just goes back to Vader did it first. A guy his size doing moonsaults off the top rope and some of the stuff we had never seen about that before for a guy his size. Well, even the guys that felt like, you know, he's too big to be doing that stuff, you still had to marvel at it, you know. I, I got to admit, there was times when I went, God, if he's doing that, what does that leave for the Rey Mysterios of the world and stuff to do? You know what I mean? So was there pushback, though, to your point? You made a, was there kind of some pushback in the back? Says, Vader, you shouldn't be doing that. No, that's, that was okay. my personal opinion, just just thinking in terms of, sure. of the way I'd been taught and certain guys, you know. You didn't have Rey Mysterios knocking – uh, Vader down with a tackle, you know, and the other, the other way to look at it was you didn't have Vader doing Ray stuff to guys. That was just me. That was just, a. that's a good point. It's just a one-off It's just structure of the business and what I was used to and the way I'd grown up in the business. And maybe it was just because it'd never been done before. To your point, it's, it was the evolution of the business, uh, and to see somebody be able to do stuff like that. Yep. And thank God there wasn't a lot of them, you know, Yeah, yeah. that would have really muddied the waters up. I think. Yeah. The guys that could, it just made him that much more special and unique. We never saw Yambag Jones, favorite wrestler, Elegante doing moonsaults. Oh, please stop. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I it's too my... early to start with, with too, too early with the YouTube, our first YouTube live. Yeah. Stuff. Yes, please. <laughs> Oh, uh, so good. All right, let's move on because now we have two guys that I know you think very much highly of. Alex Wright defeated John Paul Levesque on the show in 14 minutes and three seconds. Yes, I repeat, Alex Wright beat, I'm just going to call him Paul Levesque on the show in 14 minutes and three seconds. One thing that stands out about this match is that these two men are young, up and coming performers. Hell, you can say that again. But they need that veteran to mentor them. And in the coming months, Double A, you're going to work very closely with Alex Wright, who we've not really spent a lot of time talking about. What did you see immediately in Alex Wright uh, that for you, you were like, hey, man, this kid's got potential? Yeah, I mean, he had a, uh, he had a different style. He... Obviously, he had the German accent, you know, and uh, just no history of in the States. Hey, I remember this guy from here. I remember when he wrestled in Dallas. I remember when he wrestled in Atlanta, or I remember when he wrestled in. He was fresh. He was new. He, I mean, he was really young when he was in WCW, right? Yeah. Really young. And, uh, you know, you could just tell that the, the kid was was going to be a good performer, and uh, and he he was second generation. I believe his dad was in the business as well, so he had that going for him. Which, you know, he had some locker room etiquette already put in place, and he just seemed like he was going to go places. What do you think? Why do you think he didn't go more places? Uh, not sure. Yeah. Not sure. Um, I know he completely changed his gimmick and turned into, you remember when he changed his gimmick and he left for a while and came back and it was like a very, really dark black or all black. And that's right. Had a, had the manager. What was the big guy with the blonde hair? Who was who was a good hand too, but I mean the whole gimmick changed. <laughs> he changed. Oh, there it is. You know what I'm already loving the YouTube live. He became Berlin. Berlin. That's right. Yes. Which the wall, have, and the wall was his. Uh, the wall was his manager. Oh thank my you for whoever found oh, that and posted. This is this is a home run already. And it, it looks it, it's a research guy. It's Andrew Hermes. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. And I mean that whole thing it, to. Alex Wright was un 
you couldn't unrecognizable when he came back as that guy. Yeah. And yeah. And I think it might have been so over the top. Bad creative. That they they shut it down. They being the company. So All right. Just, yeah, he he uh he and then and then all of a sudden to your point, as soon as you get that bad creative, it's it's at least there it was kind of hard to come back from. Well, I think people were screaming Nazi. Yeah. And when you scream Nazi, that means some really bad things in the past, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, the Holocaust. You know, yeah. there were if you had two people that were offended by that, that's not something that you want you know, even on your radar. So I think that that it didn't last, but just a second. Mm. He, uh, the research guy in the chat and says that, uh, and I guess he's talking about, I can't believe this cause I had never heard this, but he had a stroke and it ended his in ring career after WCW closed. Have oh, Alex, Alex yeah. did. No, I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, Hmm. Well, wow. good, good, good call out too from I am the 83. And then you have the Columbine stuffs around the Berlin gimmick era too. All that stuff coming together, man. It's just not good stuff. It's not just too work. over the, it was just too yeah, over the top. Yeah. Yeah. Nah. Good call out. I am the 83 as well. And, and you know what, you know what I love about this, this chat is this makes us so much more, uh, we're bringing the fans into the show and uh, I, I love it. Absolutely. Let's continue to move on through this card. We're never going to get through it tonight. Aren't nasty boys. Take it on the Harlem heat. That match goes 17 minutes, 49 seconds ends in DQ when sister Sherry interferes in the match. And uh, for her trouble, buddy, she has her face shoved into the nasty boys armpit because of course she does <laughs> better her than me. Yeah, yeah. Meltzer speculated there were not enough matches to fill the card, and that's why all but one of the matches on the card went over 10 minutes. But, man, when you got a, some brawlers like the Nasty Boys paired with workers like Booker T and a tough guy uh, like Stevie Ray, is 10 minutes just right, or is there a way to know what would be the best time to target? These guys are just going to beat the hell out of each other. Yeah, I mean, I think it was probably just a slugfest. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and just in passing, I loved Sherry with the Heat, Harlem Heat. What a what a perfect fit. Those guys were so good together. I mean, I loved them together. They were great. Oh, so good. And by the way, real quick, I just want to jump in and say we have I want to thank everyone right now that is listening and viewing this. Our our live view count continues to climb and you're taking your time out of your busy schedule to be here with Arn and I right now and this is our first ever live and we can't thank you enough. It means a ton. If you want to get a question in in regards to our topic tonight December 1994, the easiest way for it to flag for me is use that super chat function and I'll see it pretty easy. Uh, and we're going to do ask Arn anything in a couple weeks right here where I'm just going to go through the chat and just read your questions and it's going to be a hell of a time. But Arn, up next, Mr. T wrestles Kevin Sullivan. I, I, uh, I'd love to talk to Kevin about this. We're still having Kevin Sullivan on the show. Wait so. a minute. Yeah. Mr. T. Mr. Freaking T. B.A. Baracus from the A-Team. Yeah. Yeah. He was on this card? Buddy, they, they, this is like the, I think this is like, the, what, the third pay-per-view in a row that we've seen Mr. T since Hulk Hogan's been here? Oh, I mean, I so, really don't remember that. Well, no, nobody does. Only the research guy remembers that having had to look this shitty pay-per-view up and go here. Listen, he wrestles <sighs> Kevin Sullivan. And thankfully, it was short because it goes four minutes. That's why we don't oh. remember it. Dave Sullivan, dressed as Santa Claus, helps Mr. T win the match when he hits Kevin in the back of the head with the Santa bag. Not the yam bag, but the Santa bag that happened to have Jimmy Hart's megaphone in the bag. Following the match, Kevin beats Dave down, used a pile driver on him to leave him laying in the ring. Again, Mr. T involved in another pay-per-view, thanks to Hulk Hogan and the power he wielded. After three months, three events, was there anything left for the former B.A. Baracus, Mr. T? Uh, or was it time to put this creative out of its misery, Arn? Well, probably prior to this match, I would think, don't you? Oh, prior to this match, yes. I mean, I wouldn't have had this one. I could foresee this thing going south. 
Oh, and and four minutes they could. Yeah, I've got to talk to Shorty about this one. Talk to Shorty. Uh, Don't remember. I may have to call him just like on a separate whole separate deal. Got, what, what we should do is we're going to do, we'll have them on a couple times. So one of the times we'll do like a ask Arn and Kevin anything, and we'll bring up this match. We'll, 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 we'll have a little bit of fun. Do we have to? Oh, oh, hell yeah. Did you know that Kevin Sullivan, did you know that Mr. Fuji named one of his twins after Kevin Sullivan? His One of his twins' name is Kevin Fujiwara. I did not know that. Save that one in your back pocket next time you see Kevin at a at a convention. He must have been very fond of Kevin. Yeah, and it's and it's you can Google it. It's out there, Kevin Fujiwara. It's a real person named after Kevin Sullivan. Wow. All right, we're learning things here. Hashtag educate us. So there we go. All right, Kevin Sullivan, T, it's over. Sting and Avalanche are up next. That's right, the former earthquake will repackage him as Avalanche, and we think that's going to lead to box office dollars, of course. They wrestle for over 15 minutes, and once again, this match ended by DQ when here he comes, as you call him, Shorty. Kevin Sullivan comes out again, interferes in the match. Avalanche and Sullivan continue the attack on Sting until Hulkamania makes his way to the ring, clearing it with a steel chair. And a couple quick points here. First, it's another DQ. So we're starting to see why this was not pay-per-view of the year. Crowd's already seen that. Second, they saw Sullivan in the previous match, Arn, and now here he is again getting involved in another match. Finally, Hulk, who's defending the world title in the main event, comes out to make the save for Sting after being splashed by Avalanche. Can you please help make sense of this booking? Uh, what might you have done instead of all this what, hot mess? Sting wins with his finish, period. You don't see the main event until it's time for the main event. Don't you think that water's hogging down a little bit, doing a run-in? Now he's got to have a comeback and have a full entrance a match or two later? Yeah. That's wrong. Yes. Yeah. You save your superstar, your main event guy, and you don't see him until it's time for the main event. And the thing about it is, Sting should have won that match. He was your long-term face of the company. Professor Drew Landry, I see your question. I'm going to come to you as soon as we wrap up the topic here. Uh, same thing for you, uh, GD Willa. We're going to get to yours as well before we wrap up the show. So we'll continue on with what's happening here. And uh, now we have the not so highly anticipated main event of the evening. The match was given three quarters of a star of one star, just three quarters of one star. Hulk Hogan defeats the butcher. That's right. Brutai, brother Brutai in just over 12 minutes with the big boot and the leg drop after outside interference from guess who Sullivan and avalanche. They tried to interfere and it fails. Look at you. You're gritting your teeth. It's it's what are we doing? It, tell, it smells bad. It tastes bad. It's the wrong thing to do. It's you're trying to it. protect you're trying to protect too many guys. And that's we're over in Germany, right? No, this is back in Nashville. Oh, we this is back in back. Nashville. Nashville. Okay. Yeah. If it was Germany, it would have drawn maybe a thousand or so. Okay, my bad. Yeah. But so you had a big house, you had a good house. So you know, give them what they expect. You know, sometimes your good guys just have to win. That's what they do. That's why they're good guys. It's uh so so you got the faces of the three faces of fear here attacking Hulk after the match. Who comes out to to run out to the ring with a chair? Randy the Macho Man Savage, who we started the show all out with, acting as though he's going to help the faces. Instead, he turns on the heels and he helps Hogan. So now he's here to help Hogan. He thwarts off the attack. Hulk and Savage shake hands and become the mega powers. Pose down in the center of the ring. And, uh, man, that's what we got. They have Mean Gene come into the room. Vader challenges Hogan now to a match. We have um, Vader running in. He challenges Hogan. Meltzer called it the highlight of the show, although not for Gene Okerlund, who, Arn, is in poor physical health to begin with. And Vader brushed aside pretty hard, and Okerlund lost his composure on the air at the end. Arn, if memory serves me correct, this is about the time one of Gene's kidneys is actually failing. Do you think that it was Gene's decision to say, hey, I'm going to keep working? Uh, because, man, we know he's one of the greatest stick men of all time. Uh, what do you think here? Is this Gene just saying, even though I'm dealing with this stuff, I want to keep coming to work? 
it's probably the the best way to keep his mind off of what he was going through. I would think. Yeah. He's such yeah. a pro. He's such a pro. And one of the one of the most beloved, I would say, characters, not only for the fans but for the boys. Everybody loved Gene Oakland, and I mean everybody. So his love for the business probably is the reason he was there. I would think. Absolutely, and uh, you just hate to see somebody going through some of that to get knocked around, touched, you know, in, in that kind of way. Uh, but Hey, Gene kind of lets them know a little bit about it too. So good for Gene. And, uh, let's talk about the main event of the show. It's you, Arn. You're subbing for the recently fired honky tonk, man. It wasn't the main event of the show. It's the main event of our show. Cause this is the Arn show. Uh, so we saved the best for last. You're wrestling Johnny B bad for the television title. You lose the, the encounter in 11 minutes and change, but buddy, you had 20 minutes notice for this because this is when honky tonk man says I'm done. If you remember correctly, when we covered his last match, he didn't want to lose to, uh, to Johnny B bad before. So he pitched a bit a fit about that and it became a DQ. Now for this one, they want him to lose. He tries to go to Hogan. Hogan says, no, man, I'm not standing up for you with this one. You got to lose. He's already fired up about his deal because he's on an appearance deal and he wants a long-term deal. So he gets mad at Hulk for not sticking up for him. He's mad at, at Eric Bischoff. He walks out. They look at you and say, Arn, we need you to go in the ring uh, for this match. Do you recall any of that kind of happening, what that happened that night in that situation? That's kind of who I was my whole career. Yeah. We don't need you till we need you. <laughs> That's wrong. That's terrible. It's the truth. Yeah. You know, People have asked me, you know, fans have asked me, hey, do you feel like you should have been used higher on the card or lower the card? You know, you should have been world champion. All these nice accolades and all these things. The reality is I was a career utility guy that if you needed a solid first match, I could give you a solid first match. If you needed to bump me up to second after intermission, I could do that for you. If you needed me to fill in on the main event, I could do that for you. And I think this was a, one of those situations to where if you're going to have a substitution, at least make it be a good match. Meltzer's thoughts here on this one. He says, when the biggest news coming out of a show is that Honky Tonk Man quit WCW, you know nothing much, much happened on a show. With the exception of a lengthy post-match locker room showdown with Hogan and Vader to set up the uh, February 19th Super Brawl match from Baltimore, nothing on the show was either good or memorable. Arn, overall, it's an easily forgettable nearly three hours. After the show, someone brought up the subject of the first Starcade in 1983 and how well they remembered it. The funny thing was, 30 minutes after the show was over, I remembered more about Starcade 83 than this friggin' show. I wouldn't call it the worst pay-per-view show ever. This is all Meltzer, but certainly in the bottom 5 or 10%. Uh, he's pretty straight up forward with his feelings, but, buddy, I read you the card. We went through the results. This isn't one for the history books at all. Three run-ins by Kevin Sullivan? Yeah, shorty, as you call him. What is it? I mean, how could that ever, in anybody's mind, be the right thing to do? Yeah. It just wasn't. Sorry. It uh, it wasn't, and uh, thank goodness this puts a bow on December 1994. Guys, as I said, we have uh, a, a huge number of you in the chat. I'm going to still come to a couple questions before we wrap up. The next time Arn and I are together, stick to our social media uh, channels because we're going to push out there our next. It'll be in about two weeks, Arn. Uh, the 23rd is typically we do Tuesday every other Tuesday. I'm going to be in Orlando that night, and me and you can get together. So I'm thinking we maybe do the 25th, that Thursday, if, you're, if your schedule is clear. So I'll let you look at that while uh, I go through some other things. But that's going to be Ask Arn Almost Anything live. And it's going to be right here on YouTube to the entire audience of whoever logs in and watches us live. Uh, and so I'm pumped up about that. It's going to be our first ever. And we're going to do them every single month. Should be fun. Apparently, so, the audience agrees with you. They enjoy it. It so. is. It's, it's everybody. It seems like to me, and you guys can tell me in the chat if you agree or disagree, as much fun as we have going through Arn's career, how much fun do you have with Ask Arn? 
I mean, come on. I, I want to hear from you in the chat. Um, does the 25th look good to you that Thursday if we do it at 6? Yeah, you bet. If that's good with everybody else, it's good with me. All right. Uh, I think that we're going to go ahead and plan that. I am uh, I'm looking at that now, and I think it looks good to me too. So let's go ahead and plan it, and we'll get it posted out there. I'm excited about that. And I didn't mention this at the top, but this Four Horsemen Network, we also have Greg Gagne and Magnum TA, Straight Talk. That's on here as well. So you can expect some uh, some good shows coming out of them and their host, Dom. But there's a few questions that folks ask that I want to get in here before we wrap up. And the professor, Drew Landry, he said, on storytelling, Arn, you talked about this during the show, would Bret Hart make a good agent? Yes. Because he knows how to put together a good match. And he knows how to play off of last week's story and add to it building a uh, building a match is just like building a show you, you try to do it in my mind get your stories up front be sure that you cover what happened last week even if it's what's always has been cool to me is if you have something that happened outside of your group or anything like that. Let's just say I'm last week I had an angle with Brad Armstrong, but at the end of the show, Dusty had a set two with the road warriors for me to go, you know, da, 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 about Brad. Okay. But God almighty, man, did you see what happened with so-and-so? It yeah. makes it. So the fact that you're willing to dedicate some of your TV time to someone else's angle makes it bigger. Nah, no, no, no doubt about it. I, uh, some of the best of what we saw over the weekend was all great storytelling and, and stories coming to a close and we need that. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm all in Uh GD Willa. And, and again, if you have anything, super chat is the way to go for, and when will help us, uh, cause it indicates that it earmarks it for me. He says, Arn big fan. Couldn't wait till Saturday evening to watch wrestling on TBS in the eighties. He doesn't even have a question. He just wants to say thank you for the memories. Thank you. Without you, we don't have anything, guys. And I appreciate you saying that. Thank you very much. Uh, the one thing that, that I hear quite a bit at signings in different places is you were a big part of my childhood. You don't know what that means to me because that, that has a lot of parameters. That means you're spending family time with your father or your mom or your grandmother or grandfather. And it just, the fact that we made that contribution to you growing up, that's why we're still sitting here with something to say and, and people who, who care what it is. Riddler three, five, seven, nine, just jumped in and said the Arn comic book is amazing and a great piece to my wrestling collection. Uh, Arn Glad the comic book. Enjoyed it. Glad you're enjoying it. Pass the word. You guys were after me for two decades to, to have uh, something after the, the original book that I made. So I'm kind of proud of it. it. It's got some shocking stuff in it, but it's got some feel good stuff in it too. And if you're a comic book fan, apparently that artwork was superb. So thanks to Dirk and his crew. I'm going to recognize a few people while I ask you Arm, before we get out of here to talk about some upcoming, uh, sh you know, events that you're going to be at. Cause we didn't get that in at the beginning, but I want to thank guys like CG artists that are here. I want to thank Dallas Dalton and Curtis Bergdroff. And I'm guys, if I get your name wrong, just punch me right between the eyes, uh, on social, but, uh, Craig Smith, the second, uh, Andy Smith. So many of you that have joined us, Eric Tate hoop, Long time listener of the show, Jeff Pollard and Drew Landry. And I just want to give so many of you sh shout outs and thank you for being a part of our inaugural live. Little Patty, little Patty, Gene, Tutti Fruity, Oakland, missed him. Yambag, uh, Amy, everybody that's here, Amy in the house as well, too, and Allison. And uh, guys, your support means so much. Jamie McGinnis, uh, so many of you that are here tonight. So, Arm, before we wrap up and put a bow on this one, where can we see you next? What are some other some events that are you're gonna you and Brock are gonna be at? Okay. 
And you got it, Charlie. CG, you got it. <laughs> uh, for the month of April, we have on the 28th, we are going to be in West Iredale. That's in well, now, where in the world is that? Statesville, North Carolina. Okay. And that's for uh, our good friend, AML, AML Tracy is the promoter. Tracy Myers. Tracy Myers is a good okay. man, runs a good show, and it is a lot of fun to do. And that Brock will be wrestling. I will be managing. And this one's a little bit down the road. That's okay. It gives these guys uh, plenty of heads up. I have people asking me about June shows when you're in Beckley. So this is good. So we have a signing, a four horsemen, actually, reunion in Jersey. Tommy Fierro is a promoter of that. And it's going to be, uh, I think, Morrisville. Morrisville, New Jersey. What's the date on it? It's the 4th of May. Okay. And, and it's, it's a four horsemen reunion. So who is yeah, it's going to be, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think Rick is there. I think it's Barry and myself, Tully, JJ, uh, that I know for sure. Uh, and it's a one day event, May the 4th, May 4th. And then, uh, May the 26th, Brock will be wrestling again in Davis County. The 26th, that's an AML show, Davis County. And I'll have more uh, information on that. The 26th we'll, uh, we'll of May. Some more to the Ask Arn and so on, on, on the, uh, the 25th. But, man, this is going to be exceptional. Brian Haremza says, if we're talking June, don't forget July. Waterloo, Iowa. Arn goes into the National Hall of Fame, Wrestling Hall of Fame. And that's going to be in July, and that's going to be fantastic. Amy Vaughn wants to know: Isn't she says isn't baby baby doll going to be there too? Amy, I'm ex thinking that you're talking about that four horsemen in Mooresville, Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, I, I hope so. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't have the full list. You know, in June is there's a couple of shows we should probably hit. I mean, that are huge. Beckley, West Virginia, yeah. on the first of June is going to be huge. You look at that. If you pull that up on the internet, you'll see the stars. Dustin's going to be there. There's some, I had somebody some say, is Arn bringing going to have merch with them at the Beckley show? I said, you better believe Arn will have merch with them. You better believe it. And <laughs> then this one we're really excited about is a monster. It's a Comic-Con in Charlotte, June the 14th, 15th, and 16th. So that's three days at the house. It's going to be down at the convention center in downtown Charlotte. And the lady that runs it, said, hey, guys, I'm, I'm expecting fifty to 55,000 people come through there. And she said, that that's a lot of thank yous that I get to do. A lot you of know? thank yous and some Hershey bars. Handshakes, yeah. uh, no, no. <laughs> we're going to hold, <laughs> we're going to hold off on that. Oh. We'll just go with the neck hugging and handshaking. And neck hugging, there pictures. you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and he'll have comic books, guys. And if you have them already, bring them. He'll autograph them for you. T-shirts, hats, all of it. Mike Hoop's in on the Charlotte show, buddy. So he's there. And uh, Allison and Andrew, Mike, this is so cool. I love every bit of what we're doing here now. And we got, you know, so many of you watching right now. This is this has been an awesome. Arn, continue to uh, promote what you have going on. You have so many fans here that want to be a part of it. Ryan, everyone is in. Uh, Arn, this has been a blast, man. We're going to go ahead and put a bow on this one. Guys, we made it. We made a kind of a drastic change here, and it's all about you guys. And I just want to say thank you for four years of coming literally from nothing to where we are now. And I want to thank Paul for doing a great job. He's the unsung hero of this whole thing. And all you guys that offer us clips and information. and Andrew and, Hermes, baby. Yeah, yeah Andrew. We can't thank you enough. What really helps me is when you have a question, if you already have the answer that someone else has provided, if I can't remember it, if you it plug up. that in, now the, the wheels start turning and maybe I can come up with it. There's so many things that happen when you're working every day for decades. It all just becomes one vast blur. Blur. It, yeah. really, it really does. So I appreciate that. Thanks for your patience. And uh, it's almost an arm for a reason. I'll do my best every almost time. Almost anything. Answer. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> oh man so well said the love is just coming through the chat and this is uh fantastic from all of you guys check us out listen we're going to be developing a new merch store link so as long as box of gimmicks still works cool but if you do see it's not working no problem just know behind the scenes we're putting together a new merch store as well so keep continue to support us there Arn, this has been fantastic for those that helped hook us up with some super chat guys you have no idea what that means to us as well we're going this we're going rogue and now we're paving a new way. So we really appreciate all the support. Appreciate the live. We're going to be back again Thursday, August 25th, 6 o'clock. Smash the like button. Turn on the notifications. That's right, Riddler. You remind me. Tell them to hit the turn on, you know, smash those likes. Turn on the notifications. YouTube is where it's at for us. And uh, we're going to have some more announcements coming out soon. Because this isn't where we're, we're stopping either. This is just the start of something very special. And Arn and I are glad to be uh, so much a part of this. April. Damn it, Bromwell. What did I say? April. August. 20th. You That's said sick. August. Thank did you. I? See? I'm trying to rush us through the summer, aren't you? Like, I got 15 more signings to do, Paul. Slow so down. Are, are we going to be on April the 24th? It's That's April the 25th, Thursday. Six okay. o'clock Eastern. Go ahead. He's writing it down, guys. I love this. We're doing it live. We're doing it live. This is like, uh, what's his name on Inside Edition? Guys, love it. J.D. Hoop, by the way, has designed. He's here. His new, and you're going to see it on our new store soon, Hall of Fame shirt. You're going to want to get you one brand new. He just sent, emailed me it over. Once we get this new store launched, hell yeah, you're going to want to grab one. And uh, it's going to be awesome for the National Hall of Fame. Exciting times for the Arn Show. Arn, thank you so much for this, my friend. It's a new day, guys. And we appreciate every single one of you. Paulie, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Put us over on social. Give us some love there. And uh, we can't thank you all enough. On behalf of... Of the enforcer Arn Anderson. This is Paul Bromwell, and we'll see you on April the 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Four Horsemen Network with live Arn. Throw them fingers up, Arn. Bingo. We'll see you all later. <laughs>